Hi everybody. So I'm going to talk about the overall context because it's very important when we're thinking about medicinal cannabis to place it into a bigger framework. I'll give you something about uh, some information about the evidence that medicinal cannabis is effective, talk a bit about its safety, cost effectiveness, the three things that we always look at any medical intervention these days, we want to know whether it's effective, safe and cost effective. Say something about options for administration, the roles of general practitioners in Australia, because uh, no doubt about it, general practitioners in this, as in every other area of our healthcare service, are going to be the front line. And then say, make a few remarks about uh, whether there is or isn't a crossover between medicinal and recreational cannabis, and then a few concluding remarks. Well, the context of this issue of medicinal cannabis is that there's been a fierce debate, as I'm sure you've all noticed, between a, a rather punitive approach to drug policy and drug law reform, harm reduction, human rights, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, it was uh, Aeschylus, often attributed to uh, George Orwell, but it's Aeschylus who said all those years ago in ancient Greece, in war, truth is the first casualty. And it's been, unfortunately, truth has been a casualty of the debate about medicinal cannabis and also about recreational cannabis. Uh, frankly, um, it's hard to know who you can believe because on both sides, there's clearly been inflation of problems and other people have been uh, deflating problems. So um, uh, very hard to find um, anybody who's uh, objective and impartial, and it's your good fortune this afternoon to uh, have it straight from the source. Everything I'm going to tell you is going to be completely objective and impartial. Here's, here's an example of the context that you're in. Now, the, the, this is a quote from the, uh, the spokeswoman for the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which is an arm of the US government, and uh, this is quoted in the New York Times. And National Institute of Drug Abuse is pretty important in the world of illicit drug policy. It funds more than 80% of the research done in the world on illicit drugs. Um, but because it's part of the US government, it's not really a scientific organization. It's really a political organization which happens to employ scientists, not really a scientific organization. Here's why I say that. Here's the quote. As the National Institute on Drug Abuse, our focus is primarily on the negative consequences of marijuana use. We generally do not fund research focused on the potential beneficial medical aspects of marijuana. So there she is. She's saying, you know, here's our bias. Uh, and there's a huge barrier throughout most of the Western world uh, to getting research funding, to getting uh, studies on medicinal cannabis approved by the ethics committees, and most important of all, getting hold of the actual agent that you want, might want to study. So there's a big, uh, what's sometimes called the publication bias in this area that goes right back, starts right back from the beginning, funding. Fortunately, um, as the war on drugs is starting to come under increasing criticism, and rightly so, um, these barriers are starting to be overcome. Uh, now here's uh, a very important statement from, from John Ehrlichman, who some of you will remember as one of the Watergate conspirators during the Nixon presidency. Uh, and he was played a central role in uh, planning the Watergate conspiracy and then went to jail for his crimes. And uh, he also played less well-known, a central role in putting the idea of Richard Nixon to having a war on drugs so that Nixon could get back in this 1972 elections, which he won partly because of the war on drugs, which he won by winning a 49 out of 50 states landslide. So Ehrlichman said, the line against the use of dangerous drugs is now drawn on this side of marijuana. If we move the line to the other side, and accept the use of this drug, how can we draw the line against other illegal drugs? So it's very clear that John Ehrlichman realized that once marijuana goes, the whole war on drugs is up for discussion. 
Here's Richard Nixon speaking in the Oval Office at three minutes past ten in the morning of May the 26th, and we know this thanks to the Watergate tapes, and he said, you know, it's a funny thing, every one of the bastards that are out for legalizing marijuana is Jewish. What the Christ is the matter with the Jews, Bob, talking to Bob Hulderman? Uh, what's the matter with them? I suppose it's because most of them are psychiatrists. Now, I should declare a conflict of interest. I'm not a practicing Jew, but I'm Jewish descent. Uh, but at least I'm not a psychiatrist. <laughs> so my advice to you, in terms of this context, be skeptical of everything everybody says, including me, uh, especially when talking, people are talking about cannabis, medicinal or recreational. Let's look at the evidence for effectiveness, and this comes from a study published, uh, you'll see the, the citation at the bottom of the slide, you can check it out yourself. And this looked at um, uh, over 100 randomized control studies, uh, studies um, of medicinal cannabis and found evidence that 80, found 82 were favorable to medicinal cannabis, nine were unfavorable. So nine of these studies for spasticity and disseminated sclerosis were favorable, uh, three were unfavorable, and you can see for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, 40 favorable, one unfavorable, HIV-AIDS-related cachexia, seven favorable, none unfavorable, cancer-related cachexia, three and zero, chronic neuropathic pain, 12 and two, uh, other chronic pain, 11 and two. Uh, it's not just uh, scientific authors writing on their own or writing with a couple of co-authors. We've had a number of expert reviews concluding uh, that medicinal cannabis is effective, including the uh, Select Committee on Science and Technology in the UK House of Lords way back in 1997. Uh, hardly a group that you would think uh, are a group of Trotskyite Nimbin hippies. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, back uh, almost 20 years ago, concluding that medicinal cannabis works. The USA Institute of Medicine a very prestigious organization in the American system, something like our NHMRC. And then the American Medical Association did a comprehensive review of the evidence in 2009 and changed their position calling for cannabis to be removed from Schedule 1 uh, in the United States federal system. Schedule 1 in, the, in that system means no recognized medicinal benefit and highly dangerous. In Schedule 2, of the same schedule is cocaine. So according to the US federal system, marijuana is more dangerous and less effective, less useful medically than cocaine. Okay, um, so my conclusions are that medicinal cannabis is useful for relieving distressing symptoms when conventional agents have failed. So it's not, as far as we know, a first line drug, but it's a useful second line drug. And those conventional agents don't always work as you well know it. So if grandma or grandpa's got terrible distressing symptoms and all the usual agents haven't worked, why on earth can't we use medicinal cannabis? Well now, at long last, we're in sight that that's actually gonna start happening in Australia. There is laboratory and animal evidence that medicinal cannabis might be curative but so far we haven't had uh, long-term trials in humans, and it may be that in future, someone giving this talk in 10 or 15 years might say that medicinal cannabis is curative, but at the moment, I don't think we have those data. Now, um, when we're starting to talk about safety, I think the first point should be, where should the benefit of doubt be placed? And I think the benefit of doubt should be the same for medicinal cannabis as it is for every other drug. And that is really since the thalidomide disaster, catastrophe that happened in Western medicine almost half a century ago, we've taken the view that all new medicines are ineffective and unsafe until proven otherwise. So the starting position should be that medicinal cannabis is unsafe. That should be the starting position and then we change our view if evidence comes out 
that it's actually quite safe. Now, um, fortunately, there have been uh, some careful studies where cannabis has been used medicinally, that is, regulated forms of the drug have been used under close supervision, as opposed to black market use of recreational cannabis used in a kind of medical context. So in these kind of medicinal studies, um, the side of, here's a, an author, this is um, uh, an opinion from a, a well-established journal saying, side effects were modest with only 10% of patients choosing to discontinue their treatment, a relatively low proportion. Uh, <clears throat> now, many of the comments you will see about the adverse events uh, of recreational, uh, uh, many, many of the comments you will see about the safety of medicinal cannabis are based on adverse events which are said to occur in association with recreational cannabis. I have a real problem with this. Uh, you'd regard it as nonsense if somebody were to say to you, look how bad regulated alcohol is. Uh, when we look at the side effects of bootleg liquor supplied by Al Capone, it was terrible. So therefore, regulated alcohol must be the same. That is ob obviously nonsense. We have to compare like with like. And so the data we should be drawing on and only drawing on are studies of recreational, uh, sorry, studies of regulated medicinal cannabis. Nevertheless, a lot of commentators uh, uh, infer the safety or otherwise of medicinal cannabis from studies of recreational cannabis. Um, also, we need to compare the adverse events of medicinal cannabis with the adverse events that occur with no treatment, where people we know have distressing symptoms. And we also need to compare the adverse events with, of medicinal cannabis with the adverse events of the conventional treatments. And you'll find that uh, very few people provide those, very few of the commentators provide those kinds of caveats. And I think it's fair to say that while there are some physical health and mental health concerns about cannabis, as there are with most powerful psychoactive drugs, uh, there's been a, an exaggeration of these adverse events, and in my view, often a willful exaggeration, in order to preserve the status quo drug policy. Cost effectiveness. Now, this is in a healthcare system which is uh, financially stretched, as ours is, and will increasingly be stretched. This is an important question. Is it worth it? We don't have any data as yet. Uh, there's only one approved cannabinoid in Australia at the moment, Sativex, and that's likely to cost $500 a month. And you have to remember that the patient population likely to need medicinal cannabis will probably have been sick for some time and will have depleted a lot of their meagre savings. So cost effectiveness is very important for this population. I can't see federal or state or territory governments rushing to subsidise medicinal cannabis. Um, uh, botanical cannabis is likely to be much cheaper than Nabiximols or Sativex, uh, and it may be better. Now, for those of you who haven't heard about Sativex, Sativex is a trade name for a product, uh, generic name is Nabiximols, uh, which is prepared from botanical cannabis in carefully uh, and rigorously controlled conditions. So we have uh, achieved, or GW Pharmaceuticals has achieved product consistency. The product they produce in 2015 will be the same product that they produced three years ago and in three years time. They've managed through uh, highly scientific processes to maintain consistency of the cannabis that they produced it's grown under identical, very carefully monitored conditions. Uh, and it's approved in Australia for one condition, spasticity due to multiple sclerosis. Getting approval for that is extremely difficult. Uh, conditions are very stringent, and the approval is only for a short term, then the doctor has to apply again. Uh, and even if you uh, manage to get approval, 
getting the drug from GW Pharmaceuticals agent in Australia, Novartis, uh, is, is quite a challenge. So it's available in theory, but in practice it's not really available. And even if it was available, it's for most patients unaffordable. And the prices are likely to remain high for some time because the company GW Pharmaceuticals must have spent tens of millions of dollars getting their product to this stage. And unless there's a competitor around, I can't see them dropping their price quickly. So the um, conventional medicines are much more expensive also that um, are competing with medicinal cannabis uh, are much more expensive than medicinal cannabis. A Dancitron, a very useful agent in controlling uh, severe nausea and vomiting in the context of cancer chemotherapy, uh, I think is about $500 a day. And the patient is required to have an intravenous drip, therefore has to stay in hospital, and almost certainly. Now, you just imagine grandpa or grandma with not too many days left on planet Earth, given the choice of staying an extra day in hospital to have a drip with a Dancitron in, or staying at home and playing with the grandkids and having a few uh, puffs on an inhaler, breathing in cannabis vapor, what do you think grandma or grandpa would prefer, as well as the saving to the healthcare system? So this may reduce hospitalization. These are all uncertainties. Uh, I'm pretty sure that medicinal cannabis is going to be more cost effective than conventional medicines, but we don't, and more cost effective than Sativex, uh, but we don't really know yet. Sativex was evaluated in a research study in England recently in terms of whether the National Health Service in Britain should subsidise its cost for spasticity due to multiple sclerosis, and the conclusion was that uh, it was uh, the NHS had better things to do with its money. Now, plenty of options for administration. I, I mentioned that um, uh, the inhalation of cannabis vapor, and this is uh, a new technique that's come around in the last um, few years. And the idea is that for most of us in this room, for all of us probably in this room, the idea of giving a patient uh, a medicine that they're meant to smoke is anathema. Maybe um, if somebody's got a few weeks or months to live and they determine that's the only way they're going to take it, we have to accept that from time to time. But us doctors, me included, don't like that as a form of a patient taking a medicine. Well, now cannabis can be uh, gently heated to non-combustible non temperatures in these special devices that are about the size of a fountain pen. Uh, and then there are tabletop devices that are a little bit bigger, varying in price from $25 up to $700. And the, they gently heat the, the leaf and release a vapor. The patient inhales the vapor. We've had, um, we've got a trial, not me, but other, there's a trial currently going on in New, New South Wales Hospital where this is being administered. Uh, so, um, shouldn't be a barrier to using this in hospitals, even though hospitals have, um, uh, have got strict rules about not smoking. Uh, and the, the uh, second stream absorption is very, very low. Uh, so these are, um, this is really a new development. Uh, the idea that cannabis has to be smoked is an idea of the past. Uh, then we've got this oromucosal spray, which is, uh, I've mentioned before, Sativex or Nabixamol is a generic name. And it's got many attractive aspects. Uh, unlike previous products, previous therapeutic cannabinoids, the uh, Sativex contains a, a number of different cannabinoids in it. It's got THC and it's the tetrahydrocannabinol, and it's also got cannabidiol in roughly equal proportions and it's got a few other uh, cannabinoids as well. Uh, and the reason it has this is because um, there's increasing evidence, it's no, not proof yet, of what's called an entourage effect. And that is the, the guy who uh, discovered, um, uh, uh, discovered the 
biology of how cannabis works in the human brain, an Israeli called Mechulachem, Mechulachem uh, still around, um, uh, uh, put forward a theory about 20 years ago that, um, that, that one of the features of the complicated pharmacology of cannabis is that with, with 60 different cannabinoids and terpenes and other agents as well, um, that these have a synergistic effect. Now, that's not proven yet, um, but the idea is that uh, the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, that there's some synergism, some action of all the different cannabinoids working together. And that's one of the arguments for using leaf cannabis rather than nebiximols, which has only got some of those agents together. Well, we still have a way to go, and that isn't proven. Um, um, but um, that's, the, that's the second option. We've got a whole range of different tablets. I haven't um, given you those, uh, haven't listed those, because they've been, um, they're obsolete. There was no demand for them. And there was no demand for them, not just in the Australian market, but elsewhere, because they didn't work. And they didn't work because they were poorly absorbed. They were taken orally, so they swallowed and absorbed, and and the absorption was very slow. So titrating the right dose was next to impossible. Either the patient had an underdose, um, which is meant they didn't get the therapeutic benefit, or they had an overdose and they had uh, an excess of the euphoric effects of cannabis, which in this this age group very often in their 60s and 70s didn't appreciate it. If they were in their 30s, they might have appreciated it. Having said that, though, uh, a slight overdose of cannabis in somebody who's going through cancer chemotherapy mightn't be a bad thing. Some patients undergoing the rigors of cancer chemotherapy mightn't mind it too much if they're made a little bit euphoric, a little bit spaced out. It might help them to, to deal with the rigors of their ordeal. Um, there are also liquids. We've got very little uh, data. There have hard been hardly any studies on that. And I've already mentioned that, in my view, the smoked leaf is, uh, shouldn't really even be considered, except um, when we don't really have any op options because the patient uh, demands it. We don't know what the role of general practitioners is going, are going to be in, is going to be in Australia. Uh, because the, we don't know what the uh, system is going to look like in Australia. There have been uh, five parliamentary inquiries have been, uh, are underway or have been completed in Australia. Uh, Commonwealth, ACT, New South Wales, Tasmania and Victoria. Uh, and the Richard Di Natale, now leader of the Greens, uh, put forward a bill which uh, is, um, looks like it will get support from across the parties and uh, is calling for an Office of Medicinal Cannabis, which I think is a great idea. Um, and the, uh, the notion is that the, the role that the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA, normally provides in regulating medicines in Australia, that medicinal cannabis is just too far away from their usual way of working and also the field is so rapidly evolving now that it's a bit too much to ask the TGA to take this on. So um, I think the idea of setting up an office of medicinal cannabis and then in 10 or 15 years time closing it down and pulling it back into TGA is, I hope that's the way we do it. But we don't know yet whether that's going to happen. Um, uh, GPs are going to be, the, if anyone is going to disseminate information about medicinal cannabis to patients in Australia, it'll be GPs. You will be the first point of call of your patients asking for information. Of course, they'll fossick around as patients do these days on the net. Um, some of the younger ones maybe, but they'll certainly come to you and ask you uh, what you think. And I hope you will follow up on this field and it, there'll be more information coming out all, all the time. Um, but the only way we're going to get good coverage of medicinal cannabis in Australia 
as with every other field of medicine in Australia, is if we've got a strong base in primary health care in general practice. Um, now, we hear a lot about medicinal cannabis and recreational cannabis as if they're one the same thing. Um, I want to remind you that we use a number of drugs which are very useful medicinally where their use, their recreational use is strictly prohibited and if people are using these drugs and found, they're punished for, for doing them. So morphine, cocaine, ketamine and as Nicole mentioned last session, two sessions ago, um, dexamphetamine are all used medicinally and all of them are banned from recreational use. So why we can't do that with medicinal cannabis beats me. I think the, the weather question, in other words, should we use medicinal cannabis, I think the, the influence of recreational cannabis is irrelevant. Uh, we should use it, we should, the criteria for deciding whether or not we should use medicinal cannabis should be effectiveness, safety and cost effectiveness, full stop. Whether or uh, how we use medicinal cannabis, the, the fact that about two million Australians are using recreational cannabis is highly relevant. And the reason for that is when any medicinal cannabis scheme starts in Australia, it's likely to be very restricted. People are going to be nervous, people are going to be cautious. I don't really have a problem with that personally. Um, I think it's good that medicine in Australia and other countries is conservative and cautious. So by all means, start small, and if a case can be made for liberalising, then liberalise. Now, the problem with that, though, is that two metres outside the doctor's office, in other words, out in the real world, recreational cannabis is readily available. 94% of Australians say that getting hold of hydroponic cannabis is easy or very easy, 94%. So if everyone on that side of the room goes to get a pizza and everyone on this side of the room tries to get recreational cannabis, you guys will be back before those guys will be. <laughs> So, and we have to remember that. So if uh, grandma or grandpa can't get medicinal cannabis because the rules are so restricted, what's going to happen? Grandson will go out and get some recreational cannabis and say, here, grandpa, I got you some of my stuff. That's exactly what's going to happen. So if you want your medicines in Australia to be regulated, I have to confess I have a bias towards regulated medicines, away from unregulated medicines. That's my bias. Clear about it. Uh, if you want, if you also think medicine should be regulated, then I hope we move quickly from a highly restricted scheme to a fairly liberal one. Doesn't mean that we become a supply system for recreational cannabis, but it does mean that we should we have to be realistic. We can't ignore the real world. So, some conclusions. Be sceptical about medicinal cannabis, as you are about everything else. I think there's good evidence that medicinal cannabis is effective as a second-line treatment for symptoms, distressing symptoms. The side effects of medicinal cannabis are acceptable. I haven't given you all the data for that. Uh, my colleagues and I wrote a paper in the Medical Journal of Australia I should have mentioned this here in the handout. Uh, in December 2013, the first author is Laurie Mather, and we've got a lot of data on safety in that paper. It's called Reintroducing Medicinal Cannabis. It's called Reintroducing Medicinal Cannabis because that's in fact what we are doing in Australia. We used to have, used to use cannabis medicinally in Australia. It was withdrawn. Nobody's really quite sure when or why and now it's coming back, uh, isn't back yet. So we're reintroducing medicinal cannabis, that was the title of the paper. Um, it's likely to be cost effective, but we've got no data at present, uh, very little data. And I think the inhalation of cannabis vapor is a very acceptable way of quickly, uh, of being able to titrate quickly so the patient has enough 
uh, cannabis on board to relieve their symptoms, but not more than they want to have, which is the, the critical point. Uh, so think of it uh, uh, as um, equivalent to PCA, patient controlled analgesia. Uh, the revolution has come into medicine. And remember that with PCA, when your patients are pressing the button for their analgesia, remember that they actually use less morphine than when you uh, are prescribing it and the nurse is dispensing it, and they get better comfort. So that should be the lesson for us with medicinal cannabis. Uh, and final point, as always, GP's role in this will be critical. If you guys do it well, and I'm sure you will, uh, then we'll be very well off. But if you guys aren't given a chance to do it well, we'll be in trouble. So thank you very much.